indeed. Uh, I love Easter. It's just like such a happy time, right? Because then why not? Because Jesus was crucified, but then he's raised back to life. God put death to death. Like where, oh, victory, where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. You know, there's, there's hope, there's joy, there's everything to celebrate, right? And so there's a reason that on Easter, we even dress in our Easter clothes, right? Because we're just looking for opportunities to say, ah, like, God, it's so beautiful. Maybe you were chasing your daughter around this morning, like, just put this dress on. Like, the kids are like, you're supposed to be happy, you know? That's what Easter's all about, right? Hopefully that wasn't the case for you, but, um, but it's our efforts to just try to say, this is a time of happiness. One of the things that I love about this time of year, too, is, like, even the whole creation testifies to the resurrection, right? Like, the flowers are coming up, the birds are singing, the sun is a bit more intense. It's just a beautiful time. Like the rocks cry out like Jesus talks about, um, except for maybe this year, right? Because we got the snow falling down out there. And, and so, but I'm guessing that maybe for some of you, you can kind of relate to that. Like Jamie last week when she was praying, like it was snowing last week pretty good. And she said, you know, I just feel like even the creation is kind of saying sometimes when it feels like it should be warm out, it still feels like there's a season of cold. And maybe God's trying to do something in us through that. And I don't know, maybe you came here today thinking this is Easter, right? It's supposed to be a happy day. But in, for me, it kind of feels a little bit more like Good Friday. It's supposed to be a warm day today, but it feels cold. It's snowy. We just had our Good Friday service this last Friday at First Baptist with uh, the point and invitation. It was a wonderful service where we all gathered together and we worshiped together. But as wonderful as it is, it's a somber service too because really what we're doing is we're focusing on everything surrounding the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. And one of the things that you can't ignore through all of those accounts, it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is it's just filled with pain and suffering and sorrow and injustice and sadness and hopelessness and death. It's all over the pages there. And I think sometimes we tend to assume that God, he's like far off and he's distant and aloof and he's removed from the suffering of our world that we live in. But you know what? If we're talking about the God of Jesus Christ, that's impossible. Because we see in the crucifixion story just how much Jesus entered into it. God himself, Emmanuel, God with us, comes in the flesh to come and walk amongst us and take all of humanity's suffering upon himself, too. He's very familiar with suffering. He's very familiar with pain. I think that's something, in some ways, in a weird way, we have to celebrate. Uh, I was looking this last week through uh, the Good Friday story from Luke. That's what we went through at First Baptist. Uh, Luke's chapter 22 and 23. And I just made a list of all of the things that Jesus had to endure just in those two chapters just from Luke. You know, you could look at the other Gospels as well. I'm going to read some of that stuff. Uh, but I want us to be reflecting. I want us to try to, like, empathize with Jesus. Try to put yourself in his shoes when you think about all that he went through in that short period of time. The religious people, the ones that, that speak for God, for the people, are plotting to kill you. You're an outsider to the system, to the insiders. He was betrayed by Judas, one of his close 12 inner disciples, right? The, the one that he's supposed to be able to trust in the midst of all of this to be handed over, to be killed by his friend. The whole time, Jesus knew that death was looming right ahead of him. Other people might not have noticed this so much, but Jesus understood, like, right now, with every step I take, I'm walking closer and closer down the hall toward my execution room over here. There's an electric chair on the other side of that door. Like, that's the mentality that he's got. He's carrying that weight with him all along. Peter who promised to be by Jesus' side the entire time. I'll go to jail with you. I'll go to the grave with you, Jesus. 
he abandons Jesus in his greatest time of need. And when Jesus looks Peter in the eyes after he's denied him three times, as Jesus told him that he was going to, and the rooster crows, man, the shame that you sense that Peter felt in that. There's shame in this story. And Peter weeps bitterly. Jesus experienced his prayers not being answered the way that he would like them to happen. Like, God, can you take the suffering away from me? I don't want to have to go to the cross. There's got to be another way, right? But not my will be done. Your will be done. He's agonized in his spirit because of what he's about to endure. So much so that his blood, like his sweat's like drops of blood. Like the level of anxiety that you must be going through in order to do that. And then during that time when Jesus tells his disciples to be praying, they're sleeping, right? Like where's the support system in all of that? And after spending three years, day in and day out with these disciples of him, and just like focusing in on them, teaching them about the kingdom of heaven, pouring his heart out to him, saying, this is what God wants for us. This is what you were made for. This is what you were created for. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. All of this stuff, like this is how we're going to conquer the world. And then they have an opportunity to live this out when the guards come to arrest Jesus. And what happens? They lash out in violence. And you know, I don't know. I don't know how Jesus felt there. But if it was me, I would have been like, geez. Like I poured my heart onto these guys. And now like I'm at the end and they still don't get it. Like did I run this race and labor in vain? What Paul talked about in Philippians. He was falsely accused and arrested. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was insulted, he was humiliated, he was spat upon, he was given an unfair trial, he's treated unfairly by Pilate and Herod, the people that are supposed to bring leadership and order and justice to the place, you can't trust the system. His own people that he came to save that a week earlier were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah! He's here to save us. Now they're shouting, crucify him. They want him dead. And he hears the cries of the mourners, the women that spent so much time and energy pouring into Jesus and his ministry and providing financially the needs that they need, that now they're weeping over him as he makes his way toward the cross. And then, of course, there's the crucifixion. Man, like, I got a tattoo on my arm, and that hurt pretty bad to get that thing on, but I just can't imagine what it would feel like to have nails going through your wrists and through your feet and then hanging there naked in front of everyone and suffocating because that's what crucifixion did. And not only that, but but you're crucified with two scumbags, enemies of the state on either side of you. You're mocked by everybody who's gathered there, by the Jewish leaders, by the Roman soldiers, the Jews, the Gentiles, everybody, even the other guy on the cross over there making fun of you. And then Jesus went through something that so many other people through this life have and that you and I will too someday. That he breathes his last. He experiences death. And after his death, just like at a funeral service, deep sorrow overtakes the people. I think some of these people... Like, they thought that this was a good thing. We're we're shouting, crucify him. They're all excited. They're drawn up into the mob mentality thing. But then something, ugh, like I feel shame about this. We just did something really horrible. Certainly Jesus' friends and the other people that had gathered there, they watched in horror and shock at what had taken place with them. This story, and that's just Luke, two chapters, is filled with pain and with suffering. And sometimes you hear people complaining about the fact that, you know what? Like, if God is truly a loving God, 
why does he allow suffering to happen in the world? Like, because I'm suffering, or, or a loved one of mine is suffering. And if he was really good, like you say that he is, he wouldn't allow this kind of stuff to happen. And so they protest, and they shake their fists at him. And you know what? That's okay. It's appropriate to do that. Our scriptures are full of stories of people doing this very thing. People of faith, even our psalms, give us permission to do this. They give us language to shout at God. And even Jesus took advantage of that on the cross. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus experienced a feeling of God forsakenness, like that he's been abandoned by God on the cross. So that's appropriate. But I also want us to understand this. We can't accuse God of not being involved in our suffering. Because he came and he took it upon himself. He's experienced suffering that I hope none of you ever have to experience in his own body. He enters into the darkest places of the human condition and takes on our real life encounters with our deepest fears and sorrows. He's truly with us, and he stands in solidarity with us, not only in the good times, but especially in our times of pain as well. And you know, this is something that I personally needed to be reminded of this last week. Because I was reflecting on it, and you know, last Easter, for me, was one of those Easter's where it was like, it was warm sunshine, it was bunny rabbits, you know, like, I don't know if it was warm last year, is it, but it's got to be better than it is now, right? Uh, and Cadbury eggs, like, all of the delicious candy and, like, the joy that comes along with Easter. And, like, I had no idea that in a couple of months, my wife of 16 years was going to sit me down and say, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And I don't want to work on it. And that's painful. That it's disorienting to have to go through that, you know. I heard someone describe it as like that kind of betrayal that you experience. It's like you have a house, and then a tornado comes, and it just smashes the whole thing to pieces. And there's nothing left except the rubble. And you're sitting there in the rubble, and you say, isn't this awful? And your family and your friends come around you and they say, yes, it is. It's a horrible thing to have to go through that. It's disorienting. But you know what? I've experienced a lot of healing since then. Praise God. And a huge part of that is because of you all. Like, you've been so supportive. You've been so good. I have such good friends, such good family, such a supportive church, uh, a counselor that's just been super helpful to me. And, you know, there's been really good seasons where things have just been, like, good, you know? And I don't know if you've ever been through grief. Like, sometimes you can, like, know all the right stuff, and yet your emotions won't let you believe it. And so even when you're feeling good, sometimes those times they kick in. Something happens and it triggers it, you know, and it all comes back up. And it's really weird um, to feel like you're not in control of yourself when you're used to being in control of yourself, you know. And I just had something like that kind of pop up this last week. Um, I won't bore you with all the details as to why, but at the beginning uh, when things were still kind of like falling apart between me and Tracy, like we we're going to have to figure out, well, what do we do with the house? Okay, I'm going to keep living in the house. She moved off to Colorado. Um, but now what do you do with the mortgage? And so the, the thing is, it's going to take her name off the mortgage eventually. Uh, but in order to do that, you might have to refinance your home, which is kind of bad because, you know, like it's really low interest rate, like from the 2020s era. And now it might be at, I don't know what it's at, like 7%. Unfortunately, praise God, there are options out there. And so there's like this stuff like loan assumption. I don't know what any of this stuff. Maybe some of you nerdy people know what I'm talking about. But... Like, so I'm learning, like, you can apply for this stuff, and it takes a while, the whole process. And so you might get a packet in the mail later on. And I'm like, okay, great. So I applied for it, and then uh, just out of sight, out of mind, right? And now it's Holy Week, and I'm all excited to, like, hey, we get to, like, think about, like, one of the most sacred times in our faith. And guess what comes in the mail? That packet of stuff. Which isn't that big a deal, because they could just like set it aside and say, I'll get to it later. Except it says in the, in the print right there at the front page, um, this needs to be returned in 10 days. 
and five days have already been used up in the mail, right? So I'm like frantically thinking, okay, well, like I don't have a choice. I got to like figure this out this week, you know? So the beginning of the week is just like you got to get your W-2s over here and then you got to get your tax return stuff from other years over here and then you have to try to figure out how the blessed uh, printer up there works, the, the, the scanner or whatever it is so that you can email the stuff to an, an email address that you don't even know what it's supposed to be and you're playing phone tag with people and it's just like stressful ha- trying to get all that stuff done and, and saying I'm not even sure if this is going to work out, right? You're freaking out. And I found myself, honestly, in my fleshliness, just feeling resentful. It's like, I don't even want to be thinking about this right now. I didn't ask for any of this in the first place. And you know, it it served as like a tangible reminder, too, of a shattered relationship that you don't want to be thinking about, and yet there it is. And I don't know about you, like when you've ever been in that fog, like sometimes like your motivation level just goes. And I was kind of feeling that this week. And so when you're feeling like that, how do you write a message on a happy Easter sermon, right? For a Sunday. And so, but you got to. So I sat down with the text and I started reading through it. And I was reading through the Good Friday stuff because we were preparing for the Good Friday service as well. And I found through that process that I was being deeply comforted by Jesus. Because Jesus understands. He's been through it. He gets us. Jesus understands betrayal that I'll never understand. I've never had a best friend abandon me and say, hey, I'm going to hand you over so that you can be falsely accused and executed. I hope none of us ever experienced that. Jesus understands abandonment. When Peter made promises to Jesus, I'll be there with you forever, even in death, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And then what happens? At the time you need them the most, they're gone. You don't get to lean on them anymore. Jesus understood that. And so to hear that was just like, oh, thank you, God. Like, we're not alone in this. And, and you know, when you find other people that are going and sharing similar kinds of griefs that you're experiencing too, like, it's just so nice to surround yourself with people like that because you don't feel so alone in it. But you know what? You especially don't feel alone when you realize that Jesus is with you, the creator of the universe. Now, you know what? You might be thinking, whoo, this is awkward. He's talking about all this serious, intimate stuff up there, and this is supposed to be a happy day, right? And I'm not sharing this for a pity party. I'm not sharing it for like a therapy session or anything like that. I just share it because if I, as a pastor, deal with this stuff, that probably means there's a bunch of people in this room that are dealing with some kind of trauma. Like it's Easter, But it kind of feels more like Good Friday. Like in my mind, I know that this is a happy day. But in my heart and my my emotions, it feels more like cold and snowy right now. But I hope that that's what we see, too, that Jesus understands. Maybe you're experiencing brokenness in a relationship. Maybe that's something that happened a long time ago. Maybe there was betrayal. Maybe there was abandonment. Maybe it's hard to trust, again, because of some of those things that have happened with you. Jesus understands that. Do we see that in the Good Friday story? Maybe you've received a diagnosis that's grim, and your days are numbered, and you're walking down that hall toward your electric chair, metaphorically speaking. Or maybe you love somebody who's going through that. Just like the women who wept for Jesus as he was being brought to his execution. Our hearts are hurting. There's trauma. Maybe you're experiencing debilitating pain. Your back's hurting. You've got cancer. Jesus understood the physical pain. I think if we all look at the Good Friday story, especially in our times of suffering, we can see that Jesus understands this. He sees it. He gets it. 
And you know, it's already good news to know that the creator of the universe actually sits with us in the midst of it, and he empathizes with us, and he understands because he's been there. But you know what? That's not even the end of the story, because Good Friday isn't the end. And maybe some of you are thinking, are we going to read any scriptures here? Is there any good news in the midst of all of this? And I say, yes, there is, okay? We're looking at Luke 24, verses 1 through 6. But very early on Sunday morning, Sunday morning, the woman went to the tomb. Taking the spices they had prepared, they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified, and they bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. You know, like as hard as this year has been for me personally, and that the pain is real, the suffering is real, the the disorientation, all that stuff that comes along with that kind of grief and loss, it's real. Here's the thing, and I don't say this to be cheesy. I don't say this because I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to say this stuff. Like, I really mean it. Like, I have never felt hopeless through this whole process. In fact, I would even say that I've experienced joy just undergirding the whole thing, even in the midst of all of that chaos, because for the past 20 or so years now, I've been very intentional about following Jesus and trying to live out the kind of life that he's called us to live. And you know what Jesus said when you do that? It's like you build your house on a rock. And the storms of this life are going to come and they're going to beat against that house. They're going to rip the shingles off. They're going to tear the siding off of it. It's going to hurt. But you know what? That house is going to keep standing. Because you've built your life on something that's not going to be taken away. Marriages are good. Families are good. Our jobs are good. All of these things in this life that like, we find so much security and peace and identity in, there's many good things. But you know what? There's no guarantees. Stuff happens. And when you build your life on that stuff that can be taken away, the whole thing comes crashing down. But when you build your life on a solid rock, a relationship with somebody that when they say, never will I leave you, Never will I forsake you. I will be there with you to the end of the age. And he means it. And he goes to death for you. You know what that builds? Trust. Security. Confidence. Hope. Joy. And it's something that not even death can take away. That's what we need, friends. And my hope for all of us is that we understand this deep in our bones. That we worship a God who comes and he's with us in our suffering. He understands us. He gets us. He walks with us. And you know what Jesus said? If we're following him, you are going to go to a cross because that's where he goes. But our story doesn't end with an electric chair. It ends with us leaving the grave with him. And that's the promise that we have. Do we believe it, friends? I'm telling you, it changes everything to have your life built on that. The the, the craziest snowstorms can be happening outside, whatever's happening in your life, and it can't take away our joy. It can't take away our hope. Not even death can stop it. And you know, sometimes artists do a better job of communicating this. than You can try to like put it into words, but sometimes like we need music. Sometimes we need lyrics to memorize. And um, somebody showed me this song this last week, and I was just like, that's exactly right. That, that's what we all need to be thinking. That's what we all need to be hearing. So um, this is a Zach Williams song. If you're watching online, 
Um, we're going to have to mute it, and, but you can just look up Zach Williams. Sunday's Coming is the song. Um, and I'm just going to invite you, let these words be your prayer, okay? And maybe you are having a great season in your life where it is Easter bunnies and it's happy stuff and pastel colors and Cadbury eggs. That's great, okay? But maybe this is your prayer for somebody else that you know who's going through it too. So please allow these words to be your prayer. We'll go ahead and roll that video. I just love that chorus where it's like, Yo, Sunday's coming, you know? Like, I mean, and then there's all these like categories in there, like fill in, fill in the blank. Like, you got a diagnosis that you're not happy about. Your Sunday's coming, you know? Like, your relationship is falling apart. Your Sunday's coming. Like, it's hard to believe. It's hard to feel that when you're in the midst of it. But you know what? This is the promise of the resurrection, friends. It might feel like Friday, but your Sunday's coming. Indeed, it's already come. Jesus has already risen from the dead. The grave is empty. He's no longer here. He is risen. And that's the promise not just for Jesus, for us all in our hopeless, pain-filled stories. And that's the joy of the resurrection, friends. Let us follow Jesus out of the tomb and into the newness and the fullness of life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for the resurrection. If it weren't for that, Good Friday wouldn't be good. It would be Failure Friday. It would be Flop Friday. It would be embarrassing. We'd forget about it. But you don't forget about it when somebody is risen from the grave. Uh, And there's just so many implications tied into all of that, Lord, for the whole creation, for your cosmos, for the future, for eternity, for your kingdom but also for each and every single one of our tender hearts in our real situations, in our real circumstances, that everything around us says to us, it's hopeless, you might as well give up, forget about it, you might as well just start drowning yourself in alcohol, you might as well start doing whatever, Lord, that we do in order to move forward. But Jesus, you have a better way. You have overcome the grave, and you've made way to newness of life. And so, Lord, if we feel like, if anybody here feels like their house has just been shattered by the storm, and they're sitting there in the rubble of it, wondering what's going to happen, it's okay for them to be there for a while. But, Lord, I hope that they can come to see that you're building them a new home. You're building them a new place, and it's in you. And it's one that can't be toppled, and it's one that can't be shaken, Lord, because you are there, and you're that firm foundation. Lord, seal that upon our hearts, because of our emotions, and the bad weather, and the crucifixion, and so many other things can speak lies to us. Let's say it's hopeless, there's nothing there, but Jesus, help us to fix our eyes on the resurrection. Help us to be in awe of your power and what you're capable of doing in our lives and the lives of the people that we love today, in the present, and for eternity, and on forever and ever and ever and ever. Thank you, Lord, for revealing this to us and for making fullness and newness of life available to each and every single one of us, Lord. That's why we worship you. That's why we sing your praises, because you are the God who has overcome death, the greatest, most fearful thing that all of us as human beings have to deal with. And it's powerless in your power. May we find ourselves in you, Jesus. Amen.